Hi, this is Mayor Joe Gann. I'm just taking a moment in the midst of all that's going on in this health care crisis to thank those who didn't even know they were going to be a part of it, but ended up being there for all of us. Our first responders, our health care workers, doctors, nurses, our 911 dispatch, police, fire, ambulance, and even those who are working in the grocery stores and the pharmacies. Our transportation workers who are driving the buses so those who are going to work or to the doctors or the hospitals can get there. Our public facilities that are picking up the trash for all of us and keeping our streets clean. Thank them all. They're there for us. Let's be there for them. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay safe. Stay home. Stay home. Stay home. We're in this together. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. We're all in this together. We're in this together. Let's get this done by social distancing, helping to flatten the curve while we stay at home, safer at home, and we'll get through this together. Thanks for joining. We have a, a bunch of stuff to cover this morning, or actually this afternoon. And uh, we have a, a friend of mine who is going to join us, Doug Holcomb. He's been a tremendous leader with everyone at the Greater Bridgeport Transit. So uh, we want to hear from him in a minute. As we're getting him uh, set up, which will happen in quickly, uh, if you can't share, click share now. Share this on Facebook. This way more people can get information. They can hear about what's going to happen right now. Uh, or what's happening right now with the Greater Bridgeport Transit District, that's our bus service, et cetera, and what they've been doing. And you think about it, I don't know if you ride the bus or not, but um, it is uh, an interesting challenge in this Hi. state of affairs that we're in. And there he is, that's Mr. Doug Holcomb. Uh, he runs the Greater Bridgeport Transit District, so everything that's good is happening uh, on the buses and with the buses and with transportation, uh, he gets credit for. Any problems on those, uh, you can blame me. So, Doug, nice to hear from you, and thanks for all your help and your leadership. You've got um, a number of, of, of live uh, listeners. We got a picture of you up there. We need you to smile more, but you got a picture of you up there, a nice tie and jacket on today. And it's a real opportunity for people. Those that understand because they use the, the buses in Bridgeport and beyond, and some maybe they don't understand the challenges, just before you even get to the change in routes and, and the accommodations you've been making for people, what are some of the normal challenges, if you don't mind spending a second on it, and then how do you adapt, especially with sanitation and, and, and uh, social distancing and, and maybe masks and gloves, and how does that all work? And, and let me just start by saying welcome and give the floor to you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me on and for all you're doing. And uh, it's kind of a reverse. If anything good is happening, we could give it to the mayor's office. And any problems, I'll give you a, a website to call in or to, to contact us. But um, that's a good question. Hey, Doug, before you do, um, and I appreciate that, and I know it's you know half serious, half joking, but really I think it all goes to many of your employees <laughs> who are sticking it out through this, interacting with certainly with customers, with riders, and we want to kudos to them. That's what it's all about. But, you know, to be, to be out there interacting with the public on a day-to-day -day basis, um, as your employees do, as your drivers do, and others, we really want to say thank you and appreciation to them. Without them, we wouldn't even, been, we wouldn't even been here to have nothing to talk about, right? Yeah, that's correct. And, and um, these, these folks are out kind of on the front lines of a battle they never could have envisioned, never would have expected. Uh, and we're working alongside people who, other people in those positions too, who are working at grocery stores and some in the healthcare industry. No one could have envisioned something, you know, quite like this. So, um, and they're working very hard, everybody around the clock to try to adapt to this. And to answer your first question about what are some of the regular challenges is, you know, Bridgeport has one of the busiest transit systems in, uh, in the Northeast. Uh, it's got normally 30 trips per bus per hour. It's, it's enormously busy, and a lot of people are dependent on it. We're doing some 16 or 17,000 boardings every single day, right up to so about a month and a half ago. 16 or 17,000 boardings. So okay. well, that yeah. could be one person twice maybe, but it's, it's thousands and thousands of riders every day that rely on, depend on, and appreciate um, the service that's being provided. That's a, that's a lot of people. It is. It's very busy. And, you know, I've never really thought of it this way before, but social distancing and public transportation are polar opposites. So everything we've been doing yeah. since the beginning of this has been trying to balance that. 
so we've you know since the start of this we've seen a decline in ridership and we're now you know we now have about a third a little bit less than a third uh, of the riders we used to have and at the same time like other businesses, the virus has taken a toll on the GBT community. So while we're fortunate that we don't have any GBT employees who have reported testing positive, we do have many who have gone out for different kinds of leave for uh, underlying conditions that they have, like in any other business, or to take care of a child who's not in school uh, or uh, taking care of uh, uh, you know, a sick relative or something like that who's, who's vulnerable to the to the virus, but so everything that we've been doing from you know from the start and you know right through today is to try to protect the drivers and the staff and protect the riders, and then continue services to get uh, critical and essential employees to work. And yesterday, when we started the the change in the service, we met a lot of people, and it was it was the grocery store folks, you know, working at the Stop and Shops and the Big Wise uh, and the other grocery stores of the world, and healthcare folks working at the hospitals and some of the other care facilities here. So those are the people we want to transport. And if I can get one thing across this afternoon, it's that if you aren't among those folks, you probably shouldn't. You shouldn't be riding. You really shouldn't because we're trying to keep the number of people on the buses to no more than 10. So one person who's riding who doesn't need to is taking up, you know, 10% of the space on that bus. So let, and, let's uh, talk about that for a second. Let's just, sure. I find sometimes uh, being a parent, uh, I make fun of my kids because they make fun of me. Repeating myself is, is becomes a mantra for a parent. When we have this many people, uh, I think it's really important sometimes just, I don't mean that people aren't listening, they are. But let's repeat that. The, the importance right now, I mean, the, the civil, the civic, or, or the so, right thing to do socially, if you can, is to avoid being on to taking the buses, although they're there, and, and and you can. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's taken up a space because you're saying you limited the ride. So we have we have uh, grocery store workers, frontline workers who who are there every day. Otherwise, we wouldn't have literally probably wouldn't have food on the shelves. Healthcare providers that need to get back and forth, maybe to the hospitals, uh, other places, that without them, God forbid, um, uh, w w the winning this battle, which I believe we are as difficult as it is, probably wouldn't be, wouldn't be possible. And I'm sure other essential workers. So you're telling people, again, repeat it, Doug, and I don't mean to talk over you. I want to give it back to you. No, so. Yeah, absolutely. If you don't need to travel, you shouldn't be on the bus. And I have to say, it's heartbreaking for me after 30 years of encouraging people to get on the bus to even utter the words, stay off the bus. So um, hopefully that will change in the not-too-distant future. But right now, let's leave the service, which is limited, uh, out there and try to be resilient for the long haul in this and stay off the buses if you absolutely don't need, don't need to be out there. We did have one rider yesterday who informed us that he was just on the bus to charge his cell phone and you know i, I understand that but that that's not a that's not an essential trip <clears throat> agreed hey there was a couple other questions um i could toss them at you now that came in from people that are listening because i obviously this is important um <coughs> questions about sanitizing seats i know you're going to touch on this and how what riders should bring if they can and I'm sure they are because they want to be responsible and safe. Uh, what should they bring themselves for wipes and things like that so they complement the effort that the, the transit district is making to ensure safety? Sure. You know, we have a, we have a, even before this, we had a pretty good cleaning program. Again, with 17,000 people boarding every day, it's some heavy lifting to keep them clean and, and, and sanitized, so to speak. But what's hap with what's happened, I think, and I'm talking to my colleagues across the country, this, is this will change forever, the cleaning routines that transit agencies use. But since it started, we've done, early on, we started um, disinfecting um, and cleaning deeper on the high-touch areas, the pole cores, the stanchions, the, uh, the rails on the back of the seats, the driver's area, uh, all of those kinds of things. And then we engaged the services of um, a company called Janpro, which does, you know, up, in, you know, up until then they were doing uh, disinfecting of, you know, hospital, doctor's offices, things like that. Now they are once a week going through our facilities and our buses to, to, uh, to disinfect them best we can. And we're trying to um, develop that capability in-house to make it part of our regular night cleaning routine. I mean, we have service people who clean the bus, and then we have cleaners who clean the bus, and then we have a detailer who works on the buses. So we're doing a lot. But you really should, um, if you must ride and you're out there, 
you should be doing what by now most people know the CDC is recommending. Wash your hands all the time, you know, whenever you can. Use hand sanitizer if you can, if you can get it. Um, keep your distance. It's not easy on the bus. That's why we're trying to put some limits on it. Don't sit next to anyone else. And, and even though it wasn't really the guidance for the first month of this or so, the guidance now is to wear a mask. So um, you should wear a mask. We have signs posted that you should be wearing a mask. We're not going to ask you to leave because you're not wearing one, but you'd be silly to be out there on a bus or in a store these days without a mask on. Well, we're requiring that in every way we can. We're encouraging that, I should say, in every way that we can. But with city employees, and I appreciate I'm sure you're doing it with your employees, uh, those that, that interact, because uh, you want to keep everybody safe. Um, so what about the routes? I know you've made some route adjustments, and I think people, I don't think we can emphasize this enough because we don't want somebody kind of waiting for a bus that doesn't show up, not knowing what the routes are, or, or, or especially if they've got to go to work or someplace important, which should be sure, the riders. I can, give a, I can give an overview and then direct people where they can get the very specific information about, about their routes. Normally, a service change like the one we did yesterday takes five or six months, uh, you know, a half a dozen public outreach sessions so that we get and consider all the ideas from our riders. This one we have, you know, kind of just a few days. We've been thinking about it since the start, but what, what riders can expect now is um, the geographic coverage, the route coverage, is generally the same. But what we did was we looked at the ridership decline over the last six weeks, and we took some service off of routes where there weren't many riders at all and put new service in places where we started to see crowding. And uh, back in the day, crowding would be 45 or more people on the bus. Today, it's 10. So it's, a, it's kind of a different world. And so some of the routes are operating on what ri any, any regular rider is going to recognize as a, as a Sunday schedule. Four on Park Avenue, three on Madison Avenue, 13 in the east end, east side, um, 10 that goes from uh, uh, Fairfield, Blackhawk Turnpike, all the way down into Stratford. And then other routes, which are our busiest, like the Coastal Link, and the, which goes from Milford to Norwalk on the Post Road, Route 1, which uh, goes from University of Bridgeport to the Dock Shopping Center in Stratford, and 15, which goes up into Derby by way of Holly Lane Mall. Those are the same as they would be in a weekday and are, are working fairly well that way. And then our top route, which is Route 8, is, is, has got better frequency now. Uh, that does more than 100,000 boardings in a month, so we've gone from 20 minutes to 15 minutes. It doesn't seem like much, but you should be able to step out on Main Street, and in short order, a bus will come by. And then we have these um, access to jobs shuttles that go in the mornings and afternoons up into Trumbull and Monroe, and businesses there, and then also up into Shelton and Derby. In the 19X and 23, uh, as of last Friday, we suspended them, but as of this morning, we reinstated them partially. Instead of three trips in the morning and three in the afternoon, we've collapsed it into one outbound trip you know, in the morning and, and one in the afternoon for both of those. So those, those are, uh, and one of those was in response to uh, a manufacturer in, uh, in Shelton that called us and asked us uh, to provide service because they have essential employees making cleaning supplies. Oh, that's great. So, cleaning supplies are critical. Yeah, you know, when I think about, I, I love the, because it says Bridgeport and the Greater Bridgeport Transit, but the expansive uh, ride uh, opportunities and transit opportunities uh, that you provide, obviously, the, just by what you described, go well beyond. They, they, they cover so much, so it's so important. Last, maybe last question, one or two real quick, and I'll let you go. Um, are, uh, have, so the routes to the, uh, let's say, the hospitals and, and to the grocery stores, those are consistent and reliable, I assume, for those employees. And then the last thing okay. you can put them together is I st you were doing free ridership. You were really trying to help out, which we greatly appreciate it. Is that continued, and will that continue for a while? Yeah, so w when we were doing the restructuring, we, we took a, a look at pharmacies and grocery stores, certainly the hospitals, and, and there, all of those places are, are getting you know, very good service. Even, we're getting good service even before this. But we were careful you know, not to make too, too many changes there. The things that are going to affect people, 
and that they have to think about a little bit. There's really two things. One is the reduced frequency. So you're going to have to leave a little bit of extra time for travel. And also the service span. What, what we, the, start, the start of the day in the industry, the service span is when the first bus goes out to when the last bus comes from. And we're starting a little bit later in the morning, so you need to look at the schedule, and ending a little bit earlier at night. And we're doing that so that we have, uh, again, a resilient workforce, uh, and we keep some operators available, and also so that our cleaners and maintenance folks have an opportunity to take uh, take good care of the buses. So we were we were careful to to provide to you know to keep those services. Thanks so much, Doug. Anything else you want to add uh, to? Uh... Yes, I always have something else to add. Throw it out so, there. I'll just be very brief about this. So just something that riders can do. You know, um, first to everybody who went through the service change with us yesterday and still feeling it today, thanks for being so patient. The next one is leave additional time for travel, as I mentioned. Don't travel if you don't need to. If you have a mask, wear it. We'd like to see everybody with a mask. We're not enforcing the fare collection, but that is designed to protect the driver and reduce interaction at the fare box. That's the only reason. Uh, so, so, you know, don't travel if you don't have to. Don't linger at the bus terminal. The building itself is closed. And keep six feet plus when you're, when you're on the platforms. And um, one of the most important things is respect those drivers because they're out there and they're the beating heart of the service working very hard every day. And they're as frightened as everybody else is. They have parents at home and children at home, and we want to get them home safely and, and keep them coming in to help us. And then all of the details, and, and if you want to comment on them, of the service changes are at gogbt.com. So we have information out there about the service changes. It's always being updated. And there's um, also information about, you know, uh, how to protect yourself that we borrowed from the Center for Disease Control and, and the um, World Health Organization, agencies like that. Great. And I'm going to give Thank people you. a little bit of positive at the end. You and I have always continued to talk about how to improve uh, not only things we want to do together with the bus stops and uh, how we can provide more shelters at the bus stops and so on. So I think people, although it takes time, stay tuned. I know we've talked about even improving um, in some areas to provide service where we don't have it in the city. So thanks for your leadership, your partnership, and um, keeping people safe. And keep, stay yourself safe. Let's give them the message. Stay home if you don't have to be out. Leave the buses if you can for those essential workers that we need to keep what's left of our economy uh, going. And uh, you're a part of that, as is all your drivers, Doug. Thanks so much. And Thank uh, we'll you, talk Mayor. to you again Thanks soon. Thanks to city staff for us as well. Thanks for having us on. I will. Thanks so much. Well, that's great. It's great to get an update like that. And um, if you have further questions, you know the numbers, but it's GEO, uh, Greater Bridgeport Transit. It's really GEOGBT.com. GEOGBT.com. And before we go to the numbers, I just want to give a shout out. I see Pete Carroll's on, a good friend of mine, Lori. Mariam, Natalie, Frida, Carmen, Carol, uh, Nancy, and Brenda, thanks for joining um, and get the word out to people if, they, if you know people that utilize the buses, but we actually prefer people to just stay home. And this is why. Let's review the numbers. You can see on, a, on, on our map, if you're looking, if you can't, um, on the radio ICC and, and Radio Cumbria, I'll try and describe it with you. So the, the, the shades are, are varying degrees of yellow, green, uh, kind of uh, blue or aqua, and then dark blue. And there's two, four, six dark blues on there. Actually, there's one real dark blue. That's Stanford. That means they have over 1,000 or between 1,000 and uh, 5,000 cases, confirmed cases in that town. And then there's Norwalk, there's Bridgeport, uh, there's New Haven. There's Danbury and there's Waterbury on this map. It, it doesn't cover the whole, it does cover the whole state actually. And so these are the hot spots, if you will. They're the highest numbers in raw numbers. They're probably the highest numbers in percentages of population too, um, maybe in varying degrees. But um, you can see, uh, as you'll see on the next chart, at least in Fairfield County, and I think it's probably true throughout Connecticut, that the numbers continue to go up. So this idea when New York's talking about a plateau and an, an apex, apex meaning the top point of, uh, of what they expect to be uh, an, a trajectory and then to drop off, uh, I would dare say that we are not and we don't expect to be at this point, even weeks ago, to be at the apex or to be at the top. And the question is, are we even plateauing in our numbers? Fairfield County's up to 6,000, 
four confirmed cases, 6,004 cases, out of the total in Connecticut of 13,381. Hospitalizations in Fairfield County is 710. That's 710 people that have, according to the hospitals, have been in a hospital or been confirmed, uh, treated at a hospital for the total of 2,470. So, um, so that's, uh, those are the numbers. 604 people or cases, uh, 6,000, I'm sorry, we said 600, I mean 6,004 cases or people in Fairfield County that have active coronavirus cases and 206, why am I saying my number's wrong? Yeah, 262, 262 people have died as a result of this. In Bridgeport, our numbers as of last night were up to 786 people. Uh, 23 people confirmed have died from this. So that's an increase of 74 since, uh, since yesterday. So today versus yesterday. Connecticut cities overall, at least the ones that we're tracking, are all up, of course, especially in Fairfield County. Um, Connecticut cities, active cases. Stanford has almost 1,500 cases. I give you the exact number, but it's just about, just under 1,500. We're just under 800. Norwalk is about 750. I'm gonna round the numbers so it's easier to remember if you can't see them. New Haven has just about 700 cases. And then Stratford, uh, 265. Shelton, about 250. Milton, about Milford, about 225. Fairfield just under 200 and Westport at about 175. So we are the hardest hit, of course, in Connecticut. If you look at the, you can see a graph if you're not on the radio, it just kind of mirrors what we just talked about. Stanford being um, double the Bridgeport numbers, kind of double the Norwalk numbers. And uh, as you said, New Haven is fourth in total with about 700 or just under 700. Um, so there's a question some people are saying, and you know, when the numbers were low, um, people didn't really focus on them because we were inordinately low for a period of time, knowing that we were going to peak. Um, not like we're real smart or anything. We just projected out, and it's kind of been shown to be right that we'd be peaking at this period of time. When New York may have peaked a little bit earlier, we expected that. Um, we figured we'd be a week or two weeks behind them. That's kind of where we are. We're still in an upward trajectory. If you're able to see the graph that we've continued on from March 23rd, you can see how it goes up uh, the beginning of a, of a curve going up the beginning of the month, maybe April 1st or April 2nd. It starts from second to April 2nd to April 3rd. It continues to go up. It looks like it's gone up at a higher trajectory up until yesterday, today. And I, I kind of think that's a kind of a false positive that the numbers are, are plateauing out. I think because if you look at three days, which I try to run through in my mind before this, they're going up at about the same number. Um, I don't think there's anything unusual. We've had some press calls because somebody commented the numbers have gone up dramatically in Bridgeport, and they have, but they've gone up dramatically in all the hard-hit communities if you looked at them on a trajectory as well. Um, again, Stanford, closer to New York, twice the numbers. Um, Norwalk, which is much smaller, has about the same numbers. Danbury's numbers are close to that, and we're, we're ahead of, of New Haven. But we're bigger in population than all of those cities. So by, uh, by comparison, if you look at it, I'm not trying to give you a comfort level because we should not be looking for a comfort zone at this point. Um, but if you look at it per 100,000 population, in other words, how many cases do you have per 100,000 persons? Um, you'd see that we're really not off the charts. We're probably lower than some of the other communities that are on here with the same amount of numbers, Norwalk, and so on. So why do we even talk about this? I think it's important to talk about to understand what's going on, at least in our part of the world. So we kind of generally look at it, certainly as Connecticut, but it's Fairfield County, and then we look at Bridgeport in particular um, as well. But I think more important than, oh, gee, they've gone up or they're down or the trajectory is 75% or 75 degree angle or 65 degree angle from one day to the next. Gee, were those numbers that we got on Monday a two-day uh, copulation or addition of two days? So is that really three days numbers as opposed to one day's numbers? 
I think for those that are kind of following the numbers, they give us a general picture of where we are. And again, we say cases, but they're people. Well, bottom line is that we are not um, beyond, anywhere near being beyond this thing. If you went back to one of the earlier slides where you saw it going up at that 75 degree angle, what we want to see is for that to flatten out. And I'll talk about how many days I think we need to see it flatten out. And then we want to see it drop back down. At least for a backdrop to some of the probably more important statistics and then some of the interesting, so to, so, so to speak, statistics. One of the interesting ones would be the number of, of, of uh, COVID-19 cases by age group. So why do I show you this? Well, I think people should know. Uh, you, everybody's thinking about how, their own age and they're seeing where they fit in on this. The highest number in raw numbers is the age group in the 50s, so 50 to 59, and this is statewide. The numbers are dramatically lower for younger people, but they, they are existent. In other words, they're there. So it doesn't mean if you're ages 0 to 9 or you're ages 0 or 1 to 19 that, you, that you're never going to see a case of this. You can, you will, and we are. Um, and then you see them grow, go up uh, dramatically once you turn 20 years old from 20 to 30, and then they continue to go up from ages 30 to 40, and from 40 to 50, and as I said, from 40 to 40, um, from 50 to 60. Now, when you get to the 60 to 70 age group, the numbers do drop a little bit. In other words, people that have uh, uh, contracted uh, COVID-19 cases seem to drop off. I hope that's because they're being more careful. As they do from ages 70 to 80, they drop off. And then uh, 80 and beyond, the numbers are about the same. They go up a little bit. I hope it's because, sorry? Uh, for the numbers for 70 to 80 is 1,212 people. And then from uh, above 80, it's 1,314 people. So those two categories combined are, are around the same as you're getting for someone in their 50s, a little more than you're getting for someone in their 60s. I hope it's because people, as, the, as were considered a, a, a demographic by age, um, are being more cautious because older pre-existing conditions still seem to be the basis for the likelihood that this can impact you more dramatically and put you at greater risk of, of being ended up in a hospital, of possibly being on a respirator, and certainly of, of, of having this thing be one of those numbers that could possibly claim a life. So I hope it's because people are being more cautious. But it does tell us, it doesn't mean you're indestructible if you're in the 50s and you're in that number, or certainly if you're younger. I think more important, or just as important, let's say all these numbers are important, um, but our hospital capacity, and that seems to be steady. Thank God our hospital capacity in Bridgeport with two large hospitals, um, St. Vincent's as we refer to it, which is part of Hartford Health, and Bridgeport Hospital, which is part of the Yale umbrella, have stayed pretty steady. Their capacity seems to be pretty good. Uh, the numbers are 41% of bed capacity and 42% respectfully. And then we look at ventilator capacity, and those are both well below 50%. So we've got the ability to um, absorb if we have to, and if the trajectory doesn't flatten soon, um, if we don't hit the apex soon, um, there's likelihood that these numbers will change. But they have not changed, even with the increase. If you go back and look at the earlier slide, they haven't changed since the beginning of April. Um, or at least since we've asked the hospitals for these numbers. So while that trajectory goes up at a 70 degree angle or 70, 70 degree or 75 degree angle, and you see the numbers increase to around 800, um, the percentages of the hospital availability on bed space and on ventilator space continues to be good. As a matter of fact, at Bridgeport Hospital, the ventilator, ventilator space is, or availability is 31%. At um, St. Vincent's, it's 41%, just so you know the kind of the numbers that we get from the hospitals. Testing, um, again, the, the patients, all of us must order a test from their physician. Um, the doctor will place the order. The patient will receive a call to schedule an appointment at the hospital. Uh, Bridgeport Hospital's total have done just over 3,000 tests, or 3,114 tests in Bridgeport. I had my test done. Uh, I, I did it only because we were checking out a new test that could give a turnaround in 
15 minutes. We want to utilize it for our first responders. Um, we're trying to work through that process. They need to get enough available tests and then the authority to do it. They've created a partnership, as I understand it, with the city of Stanford. We want to create the same partnership for our first responders. So we've requested access to these tests, uh, serological tests it's called, uh, for police and for fire, for EOC, public safety officers. So those who test negative can return to their work uh, so they can not be tied up waiting, waiting, waiting to see what the test results are that are said to take seven days. That's if you do them the other way. This was the one I told you was a blood test. They prick your finger. I had actually had both done. Have not gotten the results back yet from the one they put um, kind of up your nose. I don't mean to laugh at it. It's not actually fun to get done, but it's one of those where you got to kind of deal with it. Okay, so why is this important? Well, we have officers, um, Bridgeport Police Department, Bridgeport Fire Department, that are out or off duty due to being quarantined. We have 11 in the PD, which is Police Department, and 21. I think it's a total of 21 in the Fire Department. We had different numbers yesterday. Uh, we got clarification on those so that those that are interested, I know we had some calls on this, and uh, these numbers are adjusted, hopefully, to be 100% accurate. Uh, the Fire Department has 21 quarantined. This is the number of officers quarantined due to potential exposure that may be work-related. It could be personal or it could be family. It doesn't matter. They're still quarantined. The test would still help us. We're still trying to get the test for them. So this is where we are, where we kind of hammered down on the stay-at-home order. We're checking off days like kids do to the end of the school year. That's an interesting dynamic, too. They're always waiting for the end of the school year. Um, we've recommended, strongly recommend a curfew that people have been very supportive of at 8 p.m. Stay safe. Stay at home. We're doing it. We're actually flattening the curve. Limit exposure. Protect residents to save lives. I mean, that's what it's about. But in addition to that, it's customers and staff at essential businesses. Um, when you go to these stores, as you heard even Doug Holcomb talking about, there's one-way aisles now in the grocery stores if you've been there. They have arrows on the floor. They have a demarcation for six-foot distances and cashier lines between, uh, yeah, cashier lines. Be sounds like cash airlines. It sounds like getting on a plane. Cashier lines between customers. Uh, they've capped or, or tried to limit uh, occupancy to half. In other words, half of their capacity so that people have room to move around with the six-foot demarcation. I love that word, de demarcation. These protective measures are helping to flatten the curve. And I just want to say thanks for your help and your cooperation. In addition to the one that you see up on the board which says, Stay six feet apart. We've got this one. You won't be able to see it on the radio, but you'll be able to see it here. We've put these up as, as many places as we could. Um, some of the seniors, uh, senior, I don't say senior centers, but senior housing where we have elderly, we've put them up where a number of people may um, get a chance to see them. It's social distancing, avoid contact with sick, sick people, and try and keep the six-foot distance as best you can. City business, that funny looking guy. That's actually me, but that was a while ago. I'm there with what's called a MadVac, and I love MadVacs. They're these huge vacuum cleaners, and we ordered them. We like to have them because they're even better, I think, than street sweepers, and they go around and they clean the city, and they could suck up a lot of stuff. Um, other things that other cities are doing, but let me just tell you, we've got our east side is being cleaned up. It was, we had to stop it yesterday because of the, the storms. But these MADVACs, you'll see them in the east side. So please move your vehicles to the east side. Move them to the even side. If you're on the east side, move your vehicles to the even side of the street. Is that today or tomorrow? No. Today. Tomorrow's on. And tomorrow is the odd side. Do you know, Let me, do, you know why? do I know why? Yeah, so they can go down the street and clean. How is even odd? We're going to get a little tutorial. How is even and odd explained? The by the, even, the date on the calendar. But I, I don't think everybody knows that. All right. So if the date on the calendar is an even number, and this is for snow too, although we're done with the snow year, uh, if it's an even number, like 14 is an even number, um, please move your vehicle to the even side of the street. The 15th normally would be tax day is an odd number. So then we'd want to move them to get our street 
sweepers and our mad vax on the odd side of the street tomorrow the 15th. What's We're doing a gr- of the street? huh? What's the even side of the street? The street that's well, the street it has the numbers that are 501 is an odd side. So if you're 501 East Main Street, you're on the odd side of the street. If you're number 500 East Main Street, you're on the even side of the street. So in addition to what we're doing, you see what I got video of some other people are doing to try and beat this thing back. You'd have to wonder. I'm sure we'll get a ton of comments on these videos, but look what people are doing in other parts of the world to try and kill this virus beyond wearing gloves, beyond wearing masks, beyond using Lysol. Let me show them the video. So appreciate it. People are doing what they can. Um, as I said, I don't think you could be too precautious or too cautious in dealing with this. I have friends that, and I, I, I don't do this fully yet, but they, they take their shoes off outside. They, they strip down in the garage. I don't even have a garage. They strip down in the garage pretty much, go right into the shower before they engage with their family and they wipe everything down. Um, go out with a mask with, uh, or, or facial covering, gloves. Uh, I like to wear a hat even just as one more protection, wipe down the car and everything like that. Other stuff that's going on. Um, we have not stopped in cracking down on things like illegal dumping. Uh, we made another arrest, out of towner from Naugatuck. Could you imagine driving all the way down from Naugatuck to dump stuff in somebody else's town, in somebody else's city as they've done here? Well, we got them on the camera uh, at Asylum Street, shows a truck dumping boxes on April 8th at 4 p.m. Um, I, said, we're not, I guess we are playing a little bit of gotcha. Uh, we gotta get the message out there. This is not tolerated. You can, uh, you can do, properly dump your stuff, but not illegally dump it in the city of Bridgeport. You will be prosecuted. We'll continue this effort. Um, Bridgeport residents, help stop illegal dumping, report it, and you get a reward, $200 reward, which should come in handy right now. You may get the reward before you get that $1,200 check the way the federal government's going. Little. Anyways, every little bit helps. There are almost 400,000, there's actually 339,000 applicants for unemployment benefits. So as much as we want these to come quickly, they are processing them. Local bridge board assistance can be at 203-455-2700 is the number 455-2700 for a live person. Just wanna run through these real quick. Other things. You got to be careful of. We're taking care of the illegal dumpers, but we need your help. But don't get caught in one of these scams. The Department of Consumer Protection and the Attorney General warn about these home scams where they say, hey, you can make some money reshipping packages. They get all your personal information. They actually send you packages, you ship them, and they don't pay you. So if you have a concern or a question or you think about engaging in one of these, call. Um, I would call, I would send you to the Attorney General's office or the Department for Consumer Protection, you can call our office and we'll try and get you routed to the right information. Getting more calls, um, this is a concern, let me repeat it. Remove and dispose of your gloves properly. Don't leave them in the shopping cart. It's great that you're wearing them in the store, that's huge. But don't leave them in the shopping cart. It's a health hazard, somebody else has got to touch them now. So maybe you're okay, but now you've created a problem with someone else. Um, the same type of thing we're trying to avoid. Please respect the employees, respect other shoppers. Uh, together, we do it. There's a slide up there that says that. Um, and now we have a slide that says breaking news. Try and get through this one without a smile. Wearing a mask inside your home is now highly recommended. Why? It's not so much to prevent COVID-19, but to stop eating. All right. I asked for a joke of the day. I'm not sure that really qualifies, but it's pretty close. We'll let it fly. Good job on getting the joke of the day. If you have jokes, you can send them in. We'll try and do a lighthearted in the midst of all this stuff. Um, serious note, but a moment of appreciation 
Uh, Bridgeport sends our hearts to our frontline heroes. Thank you for being out there. You know who you are. I could list all, but we know who you are. We see you out there getting the job done every day. Into our own team here, uh, both that make this thing happen every day at 1230 to 110 now or 111. And WICC 600 AM, thanks for being there for us, for your listeners, and Radio Cumbre 1450 AM for getting the word out in Spanish. I appreciate it. People appreciate it. And um, with that, unless something changes dramatically, we'll see you tomorrow at the same time. You can do that Facebook or Twitter at Joe Gannam, uh, Facebook at Bridgeport CT. Thanks so much for joining us again. We'll connect again tomorrow. Hi, this is Mayor Joe Gannam. And now more than ever, I'm calling upon you, all of us, to stay safe and stay at home. Now it's our time to step up to support our first responders, our healthcare workers, all those that have to be out there. Support them by staying safe, staying at home. Let's flatten the curve. We're in this together. We'll get through this together. Thanks so much. Stay safe, stay at home.